Um, with the um, with the radio microphone, it's right there, oh, and when they they got to make sure it's on, and it's on. Okay. Yep. And the, the, the really the really kind of the issue is is to make sure they're on the mic, especially it, that's okay usually when they're speaking, but you just got to say you got to stay on the mic. We use the radio, but when they're responding to questions, because otherwise the stream doesn't get them at all. That's okay. all. So if they're wanderers, you say, are you a wanderer or you... Or you oh, totally. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, and, and the control panel guys up there, they can track them so you can wander everywhere you want in this space. So don't, don't let the technology constrain you. But as long as we've got, we've got some sort of microphone action happening, and particularly in the question section. Um, yeah. Very good. Is that cool? Thank you. Okay, I've got a... Oh, very Hi. good. I was... Yeah, yeah. Nancy. Yeah, sorry. You... Is Nancy here? As no. Well? No, no, so... No. Okay. Oh, very nice. Uh, well, you... Um, 
Um, so I'll present and... Um, very good. Uh, we've got uh, 30 minutes yet. No. No. The answer is no. Because um, we're trying to keep some time for... So, look, I started off this morning. The, yes. the first session we had were only 10 minutes. Right. Now, this last session, there were 15 and 20. Do you think you could wind it up? We'll just talk with Kerry about this, yes. because it's sort of negotiable. So, we're starting up now, like, the evening. I know. I know. Yes. Yes. Yes.
Good afternoon. It's half past three. My name's Winston Roberts and I'm in the politics department here at Melbourne Uni, a colleague of uh, Peter Chen. And we have the final workshop for today. And we have three people presenting um, on very varied but interesting topics. Each of the speakers will present for 20 minutes and then we'll leave the remainder of time for dialogue. Now, the first speaker, Graham Johansson, comes from Monash University and a very interesting centre that they've got there. He's the director for the Centre for Community Networking Research and he will be speaking, looking at that interface between real communities and virtual communities. Thanks, Graham. Thank you very much, Winston, and uh, thanks for coming along, everybody. And uh, I must say I've uh, enjoyed hearing many of the papers already and uh, hope to continue to enjoy doing so. Uh, uh, my topic is uh, set out here. Uh, it is um, looking at uh, community sustainability and ICTs, information and communications technologies, uh, and it summarises uh, a, a survey that we undertook recently of uh, published information, published knowledge about uh, the relationship between community sustainability and ICTs. Uh, if you're interested in the research centre that, that I represent, uh, the uh, URL is in the bottom right corner of the slide, uh, and I am based in SIM School of Information Management and Systems uh, at Monash University. Uh, my co-author is not able to be here this afternoon. Um, Sorry, it's a bit hard doing things backwards. It might be better if I stayed on the other side. Up, up, next. Sorry about that. So, uh, what I, uh, what I uh, aim to do this afternoon is, is these three things in brief. Uh, first of all, I'd, I'd like to say why it is that this topic is of significance and, and hopefully to relate it to the theme of this particular conference. I'd like to talk about some of the current definitions of community and sustainability. Uh, I'd like to point to three current preoccupations in the literature at the moment, and they revolve around the internet, the digital divide, and the uh, discipline of community informatics. Uh, I'd like to uh, draw together a number of threads and make the point that um, community sustainability requires much more than um, uh, technology. Uh, and in fact, a number of the cases and studies that we uh, examined demonstrate this very clearly, and then there are a series of conclusions. The reasons for this study, then, are, are five in number. Um, the first one is that, that although there's a very large amount of information published on this topic, uh, very little of it has been brought together and synthesised. The second is that there are specific features of sustainability in a community sustainability context that are of significance independent of the general literature about sustainability. And the image there on the right hand side uh, shows some um, children who have um, a vision impairment in a community who are working using particular applications for learning. Uh, it's also uh, the case that recently uh, there's been a critical turning point in an analysis of this subject area in that people are looking beyond the idea of simple access to focus on the range of uses uh, of the ICTs. So it again. Um, the fourth uh, reason that, that I think that this particular uh, study is, is, is worth undertaking is that it, it uh, provides us with um, a number of uh, positive influences, if you like, uh, of ICTs on community building, and that, that's instructive. Uh, and um, the fifth and final point, and perhaps the one that most clearly links uh, this topic to this theme of this conference, is that uh, Australian governments are increasingly taking an interest in uh, this meshing of ICTs and, and, and community uh, in order to uh, consider the benefits for um, uh, social capital, healthy communities and the idea of a civil society. And the symbol is that of the World Summit on the Information Society in which uh, my uh, centre has been involved recently. Uh, a UN global effort 
to try to allow civil society to have some input into discussions about these topics. The two fundamental questions that uh, uh, prevail in, in, in the literature are about whether or not uh, the influences of ICT on communities uh, and individuals are good or bad. And the contrast is drawn, the, the dichotomy is, is clearly drawn between utopian visions and dystopian visions, between bonding and, and isolation. And the image is taken from 2001 A Space Odyssey, where some of you, if you're old as me, will remember uh, how HAL, the computer, had incredible powers uh, of evil and good. Now, if we think of the, of, the, of the two key terms, community and sustainability, there are some worthwhile things to say about them. First, in relation to community, there are a number of oldish characteristics of community that we're all familiar with and some of that are new and relate to the use of ICTs. So, in terms of the uh, of traditional community, uh, there's been a focus on the internal relationships, for example, belonging uh, among the members, and the focus tends to be inwards and the community tends to be in a physical space. So the lights of the city are there for all to see. There's a, there's a clear physical community. The new community adds some other dimensions and um, the computer screen reflects the traditional community, you'll notice in the image. There are virtual connections now possible and many of those are outwards and there are a multiplicity of possibilities there. It's, it's easy for people to broadcast their interests and their relationships. And frequently the communities are based on interest rather than physical interaction. And the interest may be a discipline, it may be a hobby, uh, it may be some other uh, uh, particular subject interest, maybe it's personal health. Sustainability uh, in the literature uh, is, is primarily related to environmental considerations, but there are a number of uh, points that uh, are specific to the area of, of community. Uh, and they are uh, six in number. Uh, so, the, 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 the recent literature suggests that for community development to occur, we need to pay a good deal of attention to the process of community interaction and community building and not consider uh, social capital just as an outcome of an imposition of ICTs on, uh, on community. Uh, the second fundamental feature is that um, it's regarded as necessary for the enhancement of uh, social infrastructure generally. The third is that it nurtures civic culture and uh, uh, predominant values uh, and the image is uh, of an ecumenical site in the US where a number of religions are coming together to form uh, a network for discussing shared interests. Fourth characteristic of sustainability in a community context is that uh, it reinforces all types of pre-existing links within the communities uh, and fifth, uh, it implies long-term commitment. And the images of an Inuit mother with a child uh, and in community sense um, parent-child relationships clearly a commitment and clearly a long-term. Uh, and the sixth characteristic of sustainability as described in the literature is that it involves participatory decision-making and that top-down quick fixes are not usually successful. Then, if we, we turn to the, to the primary purposes of linking um, community and uh, ICTs, um, the, uh, there are three points that, that jump out at us uh, as being identified as significant. That uh, the link is frequently to attract continuous funding for communities. Second, that it's to implement a, set, a, a specific management program, for example, uh, to mix public and private infrastructure or to train people in particular IT applications. Uh, and third, that it, it can be to advance a particular purpose if group. And um, uh, the example that we see uh, in the image on the right-hand side is a community computer centre in uh, Los Angeles and a candidate, a mayoral candidate, talking to some of the African-American children about what they're doing and what they're learning. The digital divide is a term that inevitably crops up in a discussion uh, of this topic uh, and um, uh, a lot of the literature is now suggesting that, that the, the term the, the digital divide serves com commercial interests in particular uh, in that frequently uh, this um, have-not-have-have-not uh, have, have not separation 
uh, allows vendors to come in with um, quick solutions and sell them uh, to particular communities. Uh, and there is a growing awareness, I think, of the social consequences of unequal access to ICTs, uh, but also of the ex- intense need for information literacy skills. Uh, and there is a, pre- a preference now for the term digital inclusion rather than the, the idea of the digital divide. Uh, and in Australia recently there's been a lot of concern about um, particular uh, disadvantaged groups within the whole Australian community. For example, people on low income, people with lower education, people over 55 uh, and people of Indigenous heritage. To um, support these um, disempowered groups, it's necessary to have ongoing continuous resourcing. Michael Gerstein, a colleague in uh, uh, New Jersey, um, is using uh, the the phrase effective use, and it's one that's being uh, picked up very quickly. Uh, And um, he he has um, undertaken studies uh, in Canada in particular, uh, in rural areas, um, in relation to unemployed people and in relation to um, disabled people. Uh, and he's also engaged with us uh, in the um, World Summit on Information Society process to try and redress some of the gaps on a global scale. If we turn to our daily lives in Australia, it's inevitable that we are connected. Uh, and uh, business and government uh, use ICTs very extensively for all sorts of pur- purposes, delivery of services. Uh, the internet is in 52% of our homes. Uh, and with the advent of mobile computing, we are accessible very much 24 hours a day. Community informatics, uh, in addition to um, looking at the uh, importance of sustainability, also addresses these other six points, and I'll just quickly refer to them. Um, they fo- it focuses on uh, enabling communities, it focuses on community-based technologies, uh, community networking, rural and regional issues, local innovation uh, and knowledge creation and capture uh, within the community for broader use. And we see a laptop in Central Australia in the desert there being accessed by satellite. The big questions are uh, about whether or not ICTs um, uh, assist in social glue or whether they help people cocoon themselves, whether people uh, uh, look to be together, whether there's bridging and bonding going on or whether they are tending to be very individualistic. And the themes that emerge in answering these questions are at the, at the bottom there. They relate to the group behavioural norms uh, concerning cooperation, reciprocity, trust and care. Um, if we look at studies of, of the use of the internet, uh, we, we can learn some quite useful things. Uh, we can, for example, discover that uh, heavy internet users tend to have interaction with broader communities. Uh, so uh, it does not tend to isolate people. Uh, there's some, uh, some facilitation of knowledge sharing, even although the knowledge may be at a fairly basic level in terms of perhaps personal advice. The internet is not good for real conversations, for real interaction. It's also shown in the various studies that we looked at that Um, Heavy internet users are heavy socialisers generally and they use other media for communication frequently. In addition to studies of the internet uh, as a community, we can look at particular particular physical communities and and what those studies show. And here I summarise the findings of six different community studies in the US. Uh, A Pew Internet uh, survey showed that... um, 84% 84% of internet users um, uh, contacted a group in the process of using the internet and of those 84%, 50%, 56% of them joined a group in a formal way. Uh, a National Geographic Society study suggested that um, heavy internet users are less likely to, use, to join groups than, than low uh, level users and possibly there's something about the novelty of internet use here that attracts new users to groups. Study of uh, Missouri Express Network, uh, which was a network right across the whole state of Missouri, uh, indicated that the content of sites was absolutely crucial for the success of uh, community sustainability. These three studies uh, I'll pass over and and invite you to um, have a look at um, 
in the paper itself if you'd like to. Um, they're uh, drawing out some more themes about what uh, studies uh, of community networks show about the relationships between um, uh, community and um, ICTs. Um, what these studies all suggest is, is at least these three points, and, and they are that community building is slow uh, and needs to be measured over an extended period of time to determine whether or not it's successful. Uh, social capital and, and, and engagement may be a prerequisite for, but not just a product of sustainability. So um, the pre-existing, the pre-existing social bonds are extremely important. Uh, and um, that uh, new and experienced network users may have different needs in terms of use of networks. Um, ideally, if we were to bring together ICTs and um, uh, community, we would have these three th sorry have these things before we began the effort. That is, uh, it, it is helpful to have established community enterprises already. It is useful to have uh, ready resources and services. Uh, if there are functioning networks, um, that's also an asset. Pools of experienced bonders and bridges in community terms is important. Uh, an awareness in the community of the power of ICTs also is valuable. Uh, an educational infrastructure uh, is also beneficial. Uh, and at times there, are need, uh, there is a need for conflict resolution skills where there's disagreement about what the needs of the community may be or how the systems are to be implemented. These are, some, these are some of the phrases that you see frequently mentioned in the literature that relate to the sorts of things uh, that I've been speaking of, beyond access, humanware, horrible words, bottom-up ICTs. Um, briefly, three cases in Australia, uh, before I come to my conclusions. Um, these, are, uh, these are community networks that some of you will probably already be familiar with. The first NTN networking the nation is a, is a, is a massive, was a massive project that's currently being evaluated by the federal government. Uh, there are two points at least about sustainability that emerge from that evaluation that are relevant. One is that the co-location of services supports all services, so where you have more than one service, more than one community service in close proximity or related, that's a support for all. Uh, the second is that, that fee-for-service, uh, a fee-for-service fee uh, helps sustain the community and it tends to be a characteristic of, of mature communities. The Atherton Gardens are shown in the image on the right. They're uh, high-rise um, housing flats in, uh, in, in Fitzroy uh, and our colleagues at Swinburne have undertaken a study of, of the uh, effectiveness of the wiring of those flats uh, and they suggest that uh, the um, uh, residents have benefited uh, very much in terms of connecting to family and friends. That's their primary advantage from being, being wired in addition to anything else that was possible. Uh, the range is a new suburb in Williamstown that was um, built about three years ago and a colleague here, Mike Arnold at Melbourne University, undertook an evaluation of the range. Uh, the range is an interesting uh, project in that it, it, it highlighted a number of weaknesses in that community. One was that the group was too small to sustain a community properly. There are only about 100 people. The other was that, that um, some of the technologies that were used were inappropriate for community building. In conclusion, uh, there are, it seems to us, uh, six negative influences uh, that will tend to diminish the impact of ICTs on community sustainability, and they are top-down imposition of goals, uh, funding of technology alone and not supporting anything else, the lack of relevant content in the uh, community um, uh, databases, uh, unattractive access spaces, so places which are unpleasant to work from, um, insufficient community members just mentioned, uh, and also premature high expectations of sustainable self-funding. If we look at the positive influences that, that uh, emerge from the, from the uh, literature, uh, they can be broken down into the three phases, these three phases, initiation, warm-up and maturity. Uh, and I've just given a few examples there of uh, the different influences at each level. So, for example, at the initiation phase, having active bonders within the community is extremely important for starters. At the warm-up phase, having a clear strategy in mind, a business plan maybe is important. At maturity level, cross-sectoral partnerships can be really important. 
for sustainability. So the other conclusions in my 30 seconds left uh, that we draw from this, uh, this, this study are that um, in, in positive terms, um, uh, online relationships extend offline relationships, uh, existing social capital enhances uh, new networks, uh, that the development of community sustainability is slow and that the process is cumulative and deliberate. Uh, continuity breeds continuity, a statement of the obvious, but, but perhaps worth saying. Uh, fifthly, that um, the co-location of networks benefits all the uh, co-located networks. Sixth, um, that sufficient pre-existing soft technology, for example, openness to training and skilling, is a very important uh, and useful prerequisite. Uh, and finally, that um, the implementation process needs to be fully consultative. Uh, there I am if you need to contact me and happy to have any feedback at any stage. Thank you, Winston, and sorry to have taken so long. Thanks, Graham, for a very interesting presentation about the interface between virtual communities and real communities. And we'll come back to question and um, discussion. Our next speaker comes from the ACT and Nancy Tucker is a member of the Legislative Assembly, a uh, member for Malongolo, it's not a lovely word, Malongolo, and the topic of her presentation is about the use and abuse of new technology and the issue of unauthori unauthorised use of uh, Member of Parliament's email. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Um, my name's Kerry, actually. <laughs> That's all right. Um, no, it's been a really interesting day. I have to say I've um, really enjoyed listening to the presenters and uh, have the opportunity to think about these, these broader issues, particularly around how, how we communicate with our constituents. But I'm speaking about a slightly more dry topic today, and it is um, a question of uh, how our parliament dealt with an abuse of um, privilege that was decided, or a contempt of the Assembly, in fact, when emails were incorrectly um, received. But before that, I just want to really quickly make a couple of comments about some of the points that have been made um, today. Um, I think on, on the question of efficacy, when we're talking about that, um, that is that very widely held view that there is a loss of trust in the community for the political institution and politicians and so on. Um, I think it is really important to look at the questions of um, the electoral systems that we have because in the ACT where I come from we have a proportional representation and preferential voting and there's never been a majority government and um, I, I can't say that there's been research done that would show that there is a greater engagement in the ACT than in other places in Australia but I do believe that people in the ACT have a, a sense that they can affect um, what happens in their legislative assembly because they can vote for people who are neither of, not in either of the major parties that there is potential for independents and minor parties such as the one I represent to be in the assembly and in fact that's always been the case the voters have always chosen to not give a majority government and this notion of uh, um, efficacy I think needs to be linked with that um, this, what is sometimes called the dem democracy deficit or the choiceless democracy when you really know there's only a choice out of one of two and they're both pretty much the same. Um, so I think that's, that is an important issue and I also think, um, also raised by Stephen, that it's interesting when you talk about um, economic globalisation or international trade rules in this regard as well because one of the um, concerns that comes out from an analysis of the current trade rules is that in fact they're overriding the capacity of parliaments both lo at local level right up to actually make decisions in the interest of communities. And so there needs to be a really careful analysis of impacts on democracy of having international trade rules. And that's not to say there shouldn't be any, but that's also part of the debate that's occurring at the moment, um, which I think is extremely important. And the other thing I wanted to say as a working politician is that there are real resource implications for e-Parliament. Um, 
and that um, it may be the case that some politicians find it a burden and they just don't think it's important to deal with all the uh, communication that comes through email. But I know many politicians, and I include myself in this, actually would like to deal with it but physically can't. And the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association has done some survey uh, work across the Commonwealth on the various levels of resourcing for politicians across the Commonwealth, and you'll see a huge range there. But for someone such as myself, I'm um, representing a minor party, I cover all issues and all electorates, and I do get an incredible amount of um, email um, mail, and um, that's an issue for the office. There are also interesting questions about, well, if you just divert them directly to um, offices of, or staff in the office, you know, what does that mean for the trust between the constituents and um, the elected representative? When I respond to emails, I respond directly, they come directly to me, but I will say I'm forwarding this on to my advisor um, who will assist you when we can don't expect it to happen tomorrow um, to follow up because I can't personally answer it. But there is, I think there are interesting issues there as well in terms of how we treat this form of communication. And one other last point I'd like to make is that in fact um, at lunchtime I met with a, business, a member of the business community and he was saying to me that as a person in the business community he now sends a fax rather than an email, so he's going back, he will send an email with an attachment but he will also send a fax to his business colleagues because it will get more attention than an email. So I thought it was an interesting reflection on what's actually happening in our community now because of the number of emails. And also as a politician of course you get email campaigns, so say we were debating stem cell research recently and abortion, on abortion I get 200 emails every day. They were a form a form email, um, but then you know you have to ask questions about how to deal with that. You send a standard response. Obviously, that's one way you can do it. And I'm not saying this to say it's a negative thing that we have this technology. I don't think that at all. I think it's got fantastic potential. But I just want to make it clear that there are real resourcing issues that have to be acknowledged if um, it isn't actually a source of frustration for people in the community because they don't feel they're having uh, being given due respect when they communicate with a member. Now I'll get on to what I'm actually meant to be talking about, which was uh, what happened in our assembly uh, on a matter of contempt. I was um, asked to chair a privileges committee in the Legislative Assembly because um, there was, uh, it was discovered that there was receipt of emails from a minister's office by a member of the staff of an opposition member. And um, the Assembly decided that this should be given to the Assembly as a potential matter of privilege. And um, basically what happened, and I'll summarise the events, uh, which led to the resolution in the Assembly, because it does highlight some interesting issues around privilege and the relationship between police and the Parliament and also courts and the Parliament. Um, the clerk of the Legislative Assembly was notified that a staff member of the opposition party was receiving email messages intended for a minister. The diversion of emails was potentially a crime under the Crimes Act and the clerk asked the IT provider to investigate the matter. On being informed that indeed a diversion had occurred, the clerk then contacted the police. Once the matter became subject of a police investigation, issues of privilege had to be dealt with. A series of meetings occurred between the clerk and the police in order to set up a process to deal with the material seized by the police. The resulting agreed process was then put as a resolution by the government to the Legislative Assembly. It determined how to deal with the documents which were, and I quote from the motion, sealed and delivered to the clerk of the Assembly on the 6th of March 2002 following the execution of search warrants in the Assembly building. And this motion was passed unanimously. The precedent of a similar case in the Senate regarding Winston Crane, Liberal Senator, was used to guide the process of the Legislative Assembly and because we've got the AFP, the Australian Federal Police, they were vaguely familiar with this issue too because they dealt with it in the Senate. Um, and if people are interested, I can give you a copy of the resolution or you can contact me by email and I'll get it to you. Um, basically, after this resolution was passed, the police were able to look at all the emails seized, but only behind locked doors in the assembly building. They identified 14 to be of interest in their investigation. 
The Deputy Clerk was then asked to look at those documents to determine whether or not they would attract privilege. In his opinion, two did attract privilege, and so the police were able to only take the 12 remaining documents. These were also copied and made available to the member whose office had received them. And this was an interesting process and it was something of a learning experience for everyone, including the police to a degree, because they had to be actually searched when they came in and out of that locked room in the Legislative Assembly. Also, um, the hard drive was taken from the uh, member's office and also locked in that room. Um, but questions of privilege and the sovereignty of the Parliament don't come up every day, although there are a couple of other reasonably current examples. Uh, there's Crane versus Skeffing 2000, um, which I already mentioned, as well as O'Che versus Rowley in 1997, where courts have been involved in decisions relating to privilege. Um, the police uh, investigation occurred and the Director of Public Prosecutions concluded that, and I quote, after careful review of the Australian Federal Police, Briefed by a senior prosecutor in my office and myself, I have determined that no criminal offence is disclosed by evidence. Whether disciplinary or other action is warranted is a matter for the relevant members of the Legislative Assembly to consider. And in a separate letter to the AFP Commissioner, the DPP noted that the recipient of the emails, quote, may have acted in an appropriate or perhaps dishonest way. In the debate on the resolution to set up a privileges committee, the opposition argued that it was unnecessary to establish such a committee because the DPP had found insufficient evidence to prosecute. However, the majority of the Assembly agreed that it was important to distinguish between the role of the AFP and the role of a privileges committee and that the fact that there was insufficient evidence to prosecute did not preclude an investigation by the Assembly itself. Matters which might be found to be contempts are not necessarily breaches of the law and it was reasonable for an Assembly Committee to investigate possible breaches of the law of Parliament. The powers and immunities of the Legislative Assembly are the same as those of the Australian Commonwealth House of Representatives with the exception that it has no power to imprison or fine a person. The privileges of the House derive in turn from those of the British House of Commons as at 1901 via Section 49 of the Australian Constitution. In looking at the matter of the unauthorised diversion and receipt of the emails, the committee found that none of the actions investigated was a breach of the Minister's privileges as a member of the Legislative Assembly because no attempt was made to prevent him participating in the proceedings of the Assembly or a committee, nor was any action taken to penalise him for anything said in the Assembly or a committee. However, in regards to the question of whether there was a contempt by the opposition staff member, the majority of the committee believes that the charge could be sustained. Erskine May in the Guide to British Parliamentary Practice describes contempt as any act or omission which obstructs or impedes either House of Parliament in the performance of its functions or which obstructs or impedes any member or officer of such a House in the discharge of his duty or which has a tendency directly or indirectly to produce such results may be treated as a contempt even though there is no precedent to the offence. It is therefore impossible to list every act which might be considered to amount to a contempt. And contempt is further defined in the Parliamentary Privileges Act and that says conduct including use of words does not constitute an offence against the House unless it amounts or is intended or likely to amount to an improper interference with the free exercise by a House or a committee of its authority or functions or with the free performance by a member of a member's duties as a member. So basically after looking at examples of practice in the Commonwealth Parliament, the committee concluded that for an action to constitute a contempt, it should include the following. Firstly, improper interference in the free performance by a member of his or her duties as a member. Serious interference with a member's ability to perform his or her duties and intention by the person responsible for the action to improperly interfere and that the interference related to the member's duties as a member. Now on the question of the status of emails, while emails do pose particular issues and there can be lack of certainty in regards to the intended recipient, the majority of the committee agreed that, that when it is clear that a person is not the intended recipient of an email, the range of obligations that apply to other forms of communication apply. It also agreed that standards applying to the confidentiality of emails are generally understood and accepted and that emails are an accepted means of communication in the work of parliaments. 
To deliberately interfere with members' emails is no different from interfering with other forms of communication. The committee concluded that secure and free communication with members' constituents is necessary for a member to be able to discharge his or her duties and deliberate and improper interference with that free communication would constitute contempt. The dissenting view from the opposition member was that, and I quote, given the different nature of email as a method of communication and the lack of established rules as to its use, finish quote, making rules and providing sanctions was tantamount to applying legislation retrospectively and was therefore wrong. The committee, um, now on the actual question of the authorised, unauthorised diversion of the minister's emails, the committee was not able to establish who was responsible for the diversion and that raised interesting questions about security in the Parliament and the role of the internet service provider. The system logs maintained by the service provider did not enable the identification of the person responsible for the diversion. And so even though the committee found on that basis that the diversion was serious, improper and interfered with the Minister's duties, and it would be open to the committee to find contempt. There was no identified perpetrator on the committee and so the committee was unable to determine intent and thus to make a finding on the actual diversion. But we did obviously raise issues about security and how the internet service provider could ensure in the future that if such a thing occurred that you would be able to work out how it happened and who was responsible. But then we had to determine whether the continued receipt and use of the Minister's emails constituted a contempt and the committee looked at the following four criteria and the improper interference. In determining whether the interference was improper, the committee had regard for accepted standards in dealing with confidential correspondence and it concluded that the continued receipt, copying and distribution of the Minister's emails was improper and the majority of the committee rejected the arguments that the action should be accepted as just part of, quote, the rough and tumble of politics, and that, or it was the same as something falling off the back of a truck. The majority of the committee held the view that the continued receipt of information or documents to which the recipient had no rights and where no conceivable public interest attaches to that receipt is quite different from a one-off leak which may be justified as whistleblowing and that interference goes beyond preventing the intended recipient from receiving his or her mail. It includes breaching the confidentiality of that correspondence by eavesdropping on it, by copying it and by distributing it to others. The dissenting view was that for contempt to be found, a person would have to have done something positive and, the passively, and that passively receiving unsolicited emails was different. It was also argued that receipt of confidential material can be important for oppositions to perform their functions. Um, on the question of seriousness, with regard to seriousness, the majority of the committee concluded that the seriousness of the interference is not measured exclusively by its consequences. The Parliamentary Privileges Act also makes it clear that conduct that is intended or likely to amount to an improper interference can constitute a contempt. Breach of a fundamental right, principle or practice is serious irrespective of the consequences of that breach. The breach of the privacy of a member's mail is a serious matter even if no significant information is obtained as a result. The suggestion from the opposition staff member concerned, presumably in mitigation, that the content of the emails was mainly inconsequential was not a matter for that person to decide. The invasion of the privacy of the constituents who had and would wish to communicate with the Minister through email was no small matter. On the question of intent, the majority of the committee agreed that it could infer intent from the person's actions in copying the emails, distributing them to party colleagues and the comments he made about intending to use the emails if an opportunity arose. And on the question of whether it interfered with the member's duty as a member, the committee agreed that as the mailbox was provided to the minister in his capacity as a member of the assembly and the content of the overwhelming majority of the emails related to his public duties, that the matter was related to his duties as a member. The majority of the committee therefore found that the person's actions met the criteria of impropriety, seriousness and intent and directly related to the minister's duties as a member. It therefore found that the person was guilty of a contempt of the Legislative Assembly. The committee process was interesting not only because we had to grapple with some difficult and untested questions about electronic communications, but also because it required fundamental ethical judgments about what is and is not acceptable in the so-called rough and tumble of adversarial politics. 
it was argued in the dissenting report that to find contempt would bring the Assembly into disregard and that it would be better for the Assembly to, quote, consult its dignity and show restraint in the use of its powers. However, the majority of the committee believed that as a contempt was established, a strong response was required. There is much enthusiasm about the potential for e-Parliament as a mechanism for enhancing democratic processes. And for this to be effective, the community must have confidence in the integrity of the system and of the officers using it. The opposition staff member concerned resigned after the committee tabled its report. And while the opposition member on the committee dissented from the finding of contempt, he supported the committee's recommendations that the Assembly's uh, Administration and Procedures Committee examine whether it would be appropriate to develop a more detailed code of conduct for members and their staff. The committee also recommended that the status of volunteers working in members' offices should be clarified by the Administration and Procedures Committee, and this was because the staff person concerned had been working as a volunteer for some of that time. So it also does raise, again, those questions about if you have volunteers in members or politicians' offices and they have access to what can be very confidential and um, personal information, that you need to have an understanding of how that correspondence is treated and respected. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry Tucker. That's um, the interface of uh, transparency and confidentiality. Now we're moving on to a, a very different topic again, and I'd like to introduce Eleanor Rennie from uh, Queensland University of Technology and Sherman Young, uh, who is from Macquarie University, and that's an interesting partnership in itself, made possible by the new technology. And they're going to explore the question of the commons, which is at the heart of communication and community. Thanks. For those of you who are in this lecture hall before, yes, I'm back. Um, but I put on a jacket, so at least you've got a costume change. This time of day we need something to keep it interesting. Um, this paper, Park Life, um, is not going to be in the conference proceedings because it's already been published in a book called um, Virtual Nation, the Internet in Australia, which is being edited by Jared Goggin with UNSW Press coming out later this year. Um, so you can find it there or email us. Um, and it, yes, it is an extremely different paper to the ones we just had in this session. Um, it's concerned with e-democracy and e-governance rather than e-government. Um, uh, and the image that you can see here on our title page um, I sourced from something called openphoto.net. I found openphoto.net by going to Lawrence Lessig's digital commons site, uh, creative commons site, um, which I think, Sherman, you're going to be talking about that. Okay, it's, it's basically a way to um, stimulate a creative commons. And so this picture comes under a creative commons license, which says that I can use it without infringing upon photographer's copyright, as long as I um, put his name there. I've also given it some serious Photoshop treatment. I'm not sure whether that's part of the Creative Commons license that I used. Um, but these are all kind of issues. Um, the structure of our presentation is going to be that I'm just going to introduce the idea of the Internet Commons. Um, Sherman's going to talk about some policy implications in Australia, and then we're going to get on to some theoretical considerations after that. Um, so the Commons is uh, an idea which describes something that everyone owns and can use. And it's been used, being used for theoretical and policy discussions around the Internet's architecture, and in particular how open access to the technology can encourage or restrict the development of new ideas and technologies. Um, describing the Internet's early uh, architecture as a commons sets any discussion of its development firmly within the territory of property rights. And in economic theory, the term property doesn't refer to the resources themselves, but to the system that governs those resources. Um, so property rights entails the regulatory systems that are put in place to determine how property is governed, for instance, how it can be acquired, 
uh, how long it might be possessed, um, whether spaces should, should be set aside for collective use. And it's often mistaken for the absence of property rights, a situation uh, which some prefer to call open access. And in an open access regime, anyone can use a resource without infringing on another person's uh, rights, even if that means that it might deplete the resource. In a commons arrangement, the use of the resource is protected, and in many cases, uh, the regulation of the commons is managed by the users themselves. And J.M. Neeson has written a book on the enclosure movement that took place in England in the 18th and 19th centuries, and that describes the way that large tracts of land which existed as commons were appropriated by the aristocracy who persuaded Parliament that um, they should be given the land. And two themes come through in Neeson's work, which are kind of interesting um, for our discussion, which is that the role that enclosure played in the development of modern capitalism and I think also something that I quite like about that history is the romanticism um, that accompanies discussions of the commoners in the literature of the time. Raymond Williams actually wrote about that too. So they were depicted as a bold peasantry, those commoners, noble peasants. And those romantic depictions are interesting because of the way that, you know, netizens who coded with their hippie artisanship have been described uh, in the early days of the internet. Uh, but the economic transformation that is occurring here is seen as the persistence of old economic structures over new ones. Lawrence Lessig describes the internet as an innovation commons, largely because the norms and protocols that governed it during its formative years had allowed it to be open, accessible and free. As the architecture uh, was visible to anyone who wanted to see it, people were able to build upon it, um, extend the technology either individually or collaborative, collaboratively ensuring that development was um, rapid and far-reaching. And as the control of the internet lay at the ends with the users, uh, rather than any central point that was possible, uh, anyone could participate in the development without needing permission. So it was, um, yeah, at the same time, there was always private ownership in the internet. So less arguing that it's not... Uh, private ownership that threatens to undermine the commons, but rather activities and technologies designed to restrict user involvement. And by describing the internet as a commons and setting out to convince the community that its structure should not be further compromised, the commons advocates, uh, with Lessig at the helm, now hope to establish a regime which, in which new and innovative ideas and technologies can continue to emerge, which is, I suppose is where e-democracy comes in, and it's also where Sherman comes in. Seamless handover, I hope. Um, uh, we're very conscious we've only really got about 20 minutes, so we're really gesturing towards the ideas in the chapter um, rather than going into great detail. So I apologise if it seems a little slight. Um, Mark Stethic, in his book, That 1997 Internet Dream, suggested that how we imagine a thing often determines how it develops. And it might be possible to invert that idea and suggest that observing how something develops, observing how it's being used, we can conceive of how people are imagining that thing. And so without suggesting that the internet is a singular entity and acknowledging that it's got a diversity of uses um, and that its technologies are used by a variety of people to do a variety of things, we might observe that many users are imagining the net in a particular way. And the one key dimension is the blurring of the distinction between information consumption and information production. Indeed, that blurring can be read, and I think we read, we read it that way in our chapter, as a definite gesture towards the idea of an information commons. So the internet for these users is not about banking or booking flights, or watching broadband sports videos, or catching up with international news or current affairs. Rather, it is, as more than one person has observed, more akin to an ongoing conversation, in which its users are as likely to create content as they are to consume it. So this internet is being built by its users. It is, in the imagination of many of them, the commons upon which their ideas can be planted and nurtured. And those common expressions, pardon the pun, range from contributing to open source software projects, 
creating their own websites, posting messages to forums, keeping a regular web blog, or simply engaging with a diversity of ideas that others are espousing out there on the net in a whole range of blogs, slashes, and wikis. The most recent Pew Internet uh, survey of US Internet users, which was about two weeks ago, I think, suggested that 44% of US users had actually added their own content to the net. So nearly half of net users are content producers. 21% uh, have posted photos, 10% have posted text, and something of the order of 2%, which doesn't sound very high, but hey, that's, you know, 2% of 130 million people or something, um, had blogs. So that's a, an interesting statistic. It's a clear then that something akin to the idea of a commons is one with which many existing internet users are extremely comfortable. More interestingly, those common expressions often understand cultural products in different ways from traditional understandings. Many of these exist in a so-called remix culture, where notions of property are reconfigured and media products are there to be used, reused, or even abused. So, in the eyes of many, it's entirely legitimate to take a copy of the Beatles' White Album, take the vocals from Jay-Z's The Black Album, and create The Grey Album. That remix culture will edit out Jar Jar Binks from The Phantom Menace. It'll rewrite, rewrite West Wing scripts. Can't get the W's out. It'll repurpose open source code. It'll even proprietary code and redistribute all manner of these remixes via peer-to-peer -peer networks. A reconception of the commons, perhaps, but a cultural shift that arguably allows new and exciting forms of expression and acknowledges the extent to which all creativity draws, as Lessig suggests, on the past. Historically, as Ellie suggested, ideas of the commons began to diminish in the mid-18th century when the aristocracy in Britain persuaded Parliament um, to reappropriate large tracts of land and forest um, for their own use. So such enclosure required the cooperation, if you like, of the state and private interests acting against the wider understanding of what the commons could and should be. Arguably, if pessimistically, there are perhaps parallels with the current development of the internet. The idea of the internet commons is perhaps under threat, not necessarily because of an evil conspiracy between the forces of darkness, but because the idea of the commons, one which many users are actually very comfortable with and embrace quite naturally, yet that idea is simply not a part of policy or corporate discourse. It's simply not part of the conversation. At the corporate level, for example, the network is embraced for its potential for profit and barriers to commons type production and consumption are becoming more and more frequent. For example, some ISPs are banning peer-to-peer -peer software. They're preventing users from using their home computers to serve their websites. Large commercial entities are restricting access to premium content to their own subscribers. Um, and such ideas, the sort of, uh, I think, used in another, in another session, but in a slightly different context, the balkanisation, if you like, of the network um, is fairly normal in traditional media thinking, uh, where companies hope to attract and then lock in uh, customers. But imagining the internet in that way, in the vision of perhaps the subscription television service, severely limits the creative potential some of which we've already seen explored. At another level, the ability to participate in the creation of internet standards appears to have been lost to normal users. Standards for particular internet layers such as web browsing and digital media file formats have largely been taken out of the hands of possibly common-like institutions such as W3C and the ISO and left to corporates whose market power has allowed the imposition of their standards as the norm. The most obvious example is the fact that many web developers code for Internet Explorer specific features that don't conform to W3C standards because it's easier and because IE has market dominance. And um, 
I don't know if you can see that slide, but to borrow, and apologies to John and Ellie for the previous presentation, to borrow their terms, there's a banal example, which is the, uh, the V8 Supercar Championship site. Uh, you can't access the video for that unless you're a Big Pond subscriber. It doesn't let you in. And you can see there, the V8 Supercar site is available only to Big Pond broadband customers. The second example, perhaps fatal, is the uh, Monash University Rehab Technology Research Unit. You'll note down the bottom there, uh, a couple of links are available only to users of Internet Explorer. Um, you know, just a couple of examples. There are thousands more if you choose to, to search out. Not always as obvious as that. Oftentimes your, brow your browser will just show up nothing uh, without telling you what the problem is. At a policy level, discourses have also tended to defer to narrow economic interest and have generally not considered the commons as a viable imagining of the internet. And this is evident perhaps in the Australian example. Uh, the broadband services expert group in the 90s paid lip service to the idea that there will be an emphasis on creation and communication by and between individuals and communities. However, the reality of the policy response at the time was largely industrial, ignoring practices that merge production and consumption in favour of encouraging top-down institutional media responses. Similarly, Creative Nation, the Keating's Labor government's 1994 cultural policy document, emphasised the development of a multimedia industry. It funded multimedia enterprise and very much insisted on that model of production and distribution. In addition, it argued, getting back to the property rights idea, for tougher copyright protection to meet the challenges of the new technologies. And those copyright challenges were eventually addressed in the 2000 Copyright Amendment Act, also known as the Digital Agenda, which cast digital technologies as a threat to existing intellectual property rights and extended the copyright regime into new media forms without expanding fair use possibilities, thereby totally limiting the type of creative potential that many on the net had already tried to explore. In terms of content regulation, the internet was drawn into the same regulatory framework as older media forms. The 1999 Online Services Amendments of the Broadcasting Services Act cast the Australian Broadcasting Authority as the regulatory body responsible for internet content. It gave the ABA gatekeeper power to take down prohibited content, as well as giving them oversight for inter internet industry co-regulation. So an industry model was forced onto what was what can only be described, at least in part, as a loose amalgam of communities and disparate users tending their information commons. That imp imposition of a gatekeeper ran counter to all those ideas of reconfiguration of production and consumption. And instead, the Australian policy approach has largely spoken to a regulatory ambition based on market protection of private interests and controlling cultural output. So internet users have perhaps thus far embraced an understanding of its creative possibilities that reach well beyond those traditional corporate and policy notions of governance. The idea of the commons might provide a more appropriate framework for this course, and I think Ellie will explore that a little further. Um, okay, well the first thing to say is that the idea of the Internet Commons is not a particularly radical concept, even though the recording industry is making it out to be a communist conspiracy. Um, in fact, it's an old idea, um, and essentially it abandons an, any idea of the Internet being free from rule in favour of an understanding that places it firmly within our social systems of rights, obligations and guarantees. Um, so if there's a threat to the corporate world in the idea of the Internet Commons, it's not that it endorses anarchy, but that it provides a basis for the revision of the concept of property on the Internet. And the Commons theory asserts that society has changed and that, as a result, the fundamentals of economic exchange and law must follow suit. What changes? Well, Sherman just described some of them. Um, and I won't um, spend too much time on that, as I think we're probably running out. Um, but... 
Some have argued, well, some argue the Commons in a strategic sense in opposition to the dominance of the global, global marketplace. However, this simple binary between state and corporation ignores the fundamental aspirations of the Internet Commons to build a future where economic prosperity is compatible with social and democratic goals. Um, I have a quote. No, it's okay, I don't have it there. Um, the purely oppositional model also overlooks the activity that occurs within the commons, a uh, reality in which people balance consumer and cultural desires, um, seldom giving the regulatory stance of, uh, a second thought. And in this way, the innovation commons needs to be seen as occurring at the intersection of consumption and production. Um, so the consumer is no longer a destination, but part of the cycle of production in an active, active and noisy way. Henry Jenkins further argues that through peer-to-peer -peer technologies, consumers are contesting ownership and control of culture through new kinds of economic le and legal relations and not simply through making meanings. So the commons is such a legal relation, challenging not only the cultural products and possibilities on offer, but suggesting new methods of gov governance to meet those demands. Um, but pro proponents of the commons base their arguments on utilitarian grounds, and I suppose this is where some of my questions about the commons come up. Um, so they're arguing that it will produce the optimum social good for the greatest number, the best situation for the most people. And they argue that we must adapt old systems to fit new situations where that will improve circumstances. And this is, a fun this is fundamentally opposed to the Anglo-American tradition, which sees property rights as natural and therefore gu guaranteed against meddling by the state on the basis of social convention. Um, so these quotes here from Lessig and Bankler demonstrate that. We must think empirically and look at what works. Um, and it, but if the Commons has a weakness, um, it comes down to whether we can guarantee that it will produce rich and useful outcomes for all on utilitarian grounds. Those that are opposed to the commons argue that it is an indeterminate and incomplete concept with no proof that the common good will, will result. The Anglo-American tradition has favoured a very different rights approach um, where uh, property is derived from our natural right to derive sustenance and reap the rewards of our labour. So this is considered to be a more substantial foundation for intellectual property rights. Um, and in this way, utilitarian arguments such as the innovation commons have proved to be vulnerable to a prevailing notion of property that relies upon unassailable natural rights and the guarantee that the owner, at least, will benefit from their labour regardless of changing social structures. Um, that's the quote I'm looking for. In the American context, this long-standing argument may very well win the battle over digital rights to the detriment of the commons. But in Australia, it may actually be the case that, utilitarian, that the utilitarian arguments for the commons don't work. Here there is a finer balance to strike between market stability and creating an environment for innovation. If the commons is an argument for systems and structures that encourage ideas, creativity and prosperity, then there is a chance that in a small economy this can only be achieved through some degree of corporate favouritism and the Oxford Foxtel agreement, um, I think was an example of that. And possibly for this reason, the NOE recommendations uh, do, and do appear limited to the economic realm. The approach encourages corporate investment in the information economy, but pays less attention to cultural considerations. And I suppose I just want to end by posing a question um, that maybe it's time to rethink the utilitarian arguments for the commons. Environmental law scholar Daniel Bromley has written that the real tragedy of the commons is the pro process whereby indigenous property rights structures have been undermined and delegitimised. This destruction of local level authority systems is the principal cause of natural resource degradation. So in the area of environmental law and first people's land rights, the Lockean tradition is being challenged on the basis that prior social and political structures should be acknowledged. Um, it's also interesting that native title coexists with the Lockean tradition as well. Uh, Rosemary Coombs has written that the Commons critique has linked together 
give it to unimagined coalitions of environmentalists, feminists, farmers, food and health activists, indigenous peoples and religious groups in the articulation of alternative moral economies of value, alternative mo yeah, moral economies of value. So the question facing us in regard to the Internet Commons, perhaps, is whether our current laws regarding digital information adequately serve a society that has come to recognise that the Internet has been characterised by a different regime of use and ownership to one that we are used to. So I'll just leave you with that. That's it. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Sherman. Nice to have some questions posed. Now it's over to you to ask questions or to make a comment to each of our speakers, Graham, Kerry or Ali and Sherman. At the back here. Um, I, I think that there, I mean, there are a number of people looking at that and the Creative Commons is probably the first place to go for examples of strategies and it does have to do with particular types of licences and how you, I mean, one of the problems is that our current system of copyright, is, it automatically, and you know, for good reason, assumes that you have copyright. So in order to put something out there in the public domain, you have to specify that. So you actually need to attach things to it. Is that the kind of... Yeah, right. Hmm. I guess there's, there's a two, two part answer to that. The first is um, there probably, uh, as Ellie suggested, a whole range of new business models being tried. And I mentioned the iTunes Music Store, that kind of is an example. You know, the, the 99 cent song download seems to be working as a model for combating the peer to peer um, file sharing model. Um, the other approach is, is actually arguments about copyright law, is actually the policy approach. Um, I know we just had a review here about copyright law uh, and to the disappointment of, of some of my colleagues, the idea of fair use didn't actually come up here. We don't actually have fair use in this country. Um, and it's one of those things that, well, maybe we need to expand our conversation about copyright um, and, dare I say it, change the parameters of, of that discussion um, as a way of... You know, we have to come at it in all directions. We can't just come up with new business models for an existing policy framework. We also need to think about how the policy works to, um, to meet the, the aspirations of the people because at the end of the day, if there's a huge bunch of people, um, shall I put it in inverted commas, stealing software or stealing music, um, then, well, they say the law is an ass. You know, it's, there's something has to be has to give a bit, I guess. No question at the back or comment. I think you're absolutely right there, Terry. I think, um, and Lessig talks about this a lot, the, the sort of the Mickey Mouse Extension Act and copyright and, and all of those things which extend copyright beyond 
you know, dating back to the Statute of Anne and its original conceptions of what copyright should be, are perhaps the problem. Um, I, I guess what everyone is kind of desperately searching for when the Creative Commons license is away and the, um, the, the sort of um, different models for music download sales is a, way, is a way to keep everybody kind of happy. Um, you know, I, I don't think anyone's, apart from a few of your madder 19-year-olds downloading millions of files, but I don't think anyone's suggesting that we don't really want people to create music anymore, or we really don't want any sort of copyright. But I think everyone's kind of arguing for more balance. There's sort of a sense that there's too much power in the hands of the owners of the copyright, and let's not forget, guys, that hey, copyright was designed not just for the owners of the copyright, but for the public good and for the dissemination of creative works to the public and the continual appreciation of that, not just to perpetuate you know, profit for the creators. So, yeah. Another question here. Just as a further comment to, to this, um, there's a number of websites that I've come across very recently dealing with uh, literature. Um, there's large bodies of books out of copyright, out of copyright material, which has been loaded onto the internet that starts. A huge number. We're talking into, you know, like 50, 60, 70,000 sort of volumes that have been sort of digitized. Amongst that lot, however, there are things that are in copyright, and there are some publishers which are taking a risk and putting books that were published last year free of the internet. Um, their understanding, their experiments, they're saying, we think we can sell more books if we release one of the, our author's novels or one of our author's non-fiction works as a teaser. Mm. And so there's all sorts of experimentation going, not just really one, but it's for several. And I think that we've now, not so even a few years ago, but now we're living into a, a, a time when that experimentation will happen a lot more. I, I think you're right, and I think that sort of search for models, and uh, I think Matthew Riley in Australia is, is doing that as well. He's um, giving away chapters of his new book for free, but he's getting sponsors. So his site actually is brought to you by Canon Printers or something. Um, it's, that's an interesting model for publishing because they've re never really gone down that path before. But, you know, like, um, when you think about it, we've had a model for distributing music free for 50 or 60 years. It's called radio. Um, and everyone accepted that as a way of teasing and getting people to buy the records or whatever. And we're going through perhaps a stage where we're exploring models for the new millennium, dare I say. Oh, sorry. Give Stephen. Um, I think that, well, Lessig is arguing that it was a commons. I think that it has common spaces on it now um, and it has the potential to be, um, to create some interesting questions around what new models we might raise. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, the... Um, I, first of all, I don't like to think of the internet as a single thing. Um, I like to think of it as a whole range of things and it's a combination of the possibilities that technologies allow and the ideas that people bring to those possibilities. And I think the commons is one of those ideas that was the technologies allowed and was, if you like, actualised and has been actualised as a number of, as, as Ali suggests, some sites around the web. You know, there are places which exist as commons type, um, I suppose, uh, experiences. Uh, that's not to say the entire internet is a commons. You know, it's, it's not that kind of monolithic. What I guess I'm suggesting is that those possibilities um, we shouldn't take for granted. That 
just because technically in the last 20 or 30 years it's been possible for people to do all this stuff, it doesn't mean that you know, uh, there will be corporate and government or sorry, there won't be corporate and government impositions in the near future that will restrict the type of activities that are allowed. Yeah, taken, taken, point taken. Um, but instinctively, I'd say I want my credit card details to be private and protected, and that's part of the internet. Um, but I don't necessarily want, you know, my blog to be private and protected. That's, you know, it's two parts of me, and it's one's private and one's public, um, and they're all on the internet, but they're not all commons. Um, so it's different usages of the same space, if you like, or different parts of the space. Absolutely. And Yep, agree. And and I guess I guess what what I would argue is that what the internet does then is makes uh the previously invisible visible. Um like music has always belonged to everyone in many ways. We've all, you know, taped old old thirty three RPM records from our sisters. We've all done all that sort of stuff and stole the music. <laughs> okay. Um, possibly. Um, again, the only the only argument I would have with that is that not all musicians would agree with that, and there's there's a, there are you know uh, I could cite several who are quite happy with um, different models of, of music sharing and, and ideas of of how music should be distributed. Um, you know there was that there was that fantastic quote from um, I think it was in a, an Atlantic Monthly article when Napster was huge. Um, and Lars Ulrich from Metallica was on a truck outside Napster saying, you're stealing our music, you're stealing our music. And one of the fans who was there to protest Lars basically said, fuck you Lars, it's our music too. Um, and you know, there's a sense that, yes, you may have created it, but that music was my life, it was a soundtrack to my life, it has been part of my life and I've adapted it and repurposed it for what I want to use it for. How dare you say it's just yours. So, you know, there's whole bunch of arguments around that. Um. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I I'm not entirely sure that Sherman and I are on agreement on everything either, um, because I I do think you're absolutely right about the limitations of the Commons, and that it is interesting to start from um, the other point of view about um, property and its use, and in fact, that I'm, I'm more interested in the way that the idea of the commons is being used politically. And although Lessig moans about the fact that he's been cast as a communist, he is an activist who is trying to assert new values into an area which he sees requires it and where things are under threat. Um, and I suppose that's why I think that in, in a lot of respects the utilitarian arguments that Lessig makes, they, they cannot work in Australia where we um, do have to, if, if we're arguing for economic prosperity as well as uh, creative and social rights, um, there's a much finer balancing act there. And, and I don't want to you know, come across too provocatively, I just I guess I'm arguing for a, a different sense of balance um, than we currently have if I'm really not an anarchist. 
I don't know about you, but when I'm going down the information highway, I'm less distressed about the doors I can't enter than uh, when there's, uh, I'm captured and bombarded by information I really don't want to see or know about. Uh, we've had some very interesting exchanges there around the commons, in terms of the commons. Are there other issues we want to raise in relation to real capital and uh, real community and virtual community or indeed to uh, use and abuse of uh, the new technology? Uh, Mike Arnold uh, gave a very good paper on evaluating the, the range and, and its successes and its weaknesses uh, that um, uh, was published, it was an Amsterdam conference in September last year. Um, if you wanted to leave me an email I can give you the, the full reference to it. Or do you know Mark, Mike Arnold perhaps? No. Um, he's here in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science. Uh, but um, in answer to your question, um, uh, the range was um, established uh, primarily by the developer, the, 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 the housing uh, estate developer, who had a vision for uh, a community that would be interacting uh, via um, a, a, its, its a, a community network. So that the houses were fully wired. Uh, to communicate with each other, but also to allow the, the, the members of the household to, to access their home from a distance. So, you know, you could put the dinner on in the microwave before you, before you left work, for example, or, you know, you could ring, ring on the mobile phone and, 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 and you know, give, give some sort of command to, to the refrigerator or, or something uh, like that. So, um, that, that was some of the technology. I mean, there was more to it than that, but, um, the, uh, the problem that, that, that has been encountered is that it was a very small community. Nobody uh, knew anybody before they moved in. So, so they, they all moved in around about the same time. Uh, and what Mike uh, uh, observed was, was you know, the lack of cohesion that probably would have occurred anyway, uh, regardless of its wiredness. Uh, so um, the, the, the solution that uh, uh, he and his um, researchers have, have come up with is to extend uh, that network more broadly into the Williamstown area and, and that's what they're working on now uh, and it's quite probable that, that it'll be a far more effective network uh, in that broader context. So you, so you had a, a, you know, a group of people with a certain income, certain educational level, all coming together uh, not, not necessarily seeing themselves as a community, seeing themselves as having bought a wonderful new house and a wonderful new location. Uh, and uh, the community spirit was very slow to develop. Uh, the one example of, of, of community action that did emerge as a result of, uh, of the wiring was that um, uh, one person who, who, who moved into the area uh, realised that um, the street trees were, were not native and um, uh, that he'd rather have natives than I think it was elms. Uh, and so he managed to go on the internet, never been politically active in his life before, uh, to go on to the, to the web and, and to campaign within that community and locally to, to get the trees changed. But I mean, I don't know that that's a great example of <laughs> you know, community connectedness, but they found <laughs> one at least. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the end of the day and I think we'll draw the session to a close here and uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to thank our speakers this, this afternoon, Graham, Kerry, Ali and Sherman. Thank you.